That's my cat, if you can hear that. I take a shower and return to my room. There, I find the set lying on the floor, her limbs spread wide. I can't help but tell her, so put her uniform on. After all, we might be called to action at any moment. She lazily turns her eyes in my direction. She's not wrong. I don't really notice while we're flying around and fighting, but once it's over and we've transformed back, it's like all the fatigue catches up at once. I get really tired, hungry, and sweaty all at once. It feels awful. When we told Commander Kennison about it when we first met, he gave us permission to shower whenever we changed back. As soon as I undid the transformation to wash myself off, I felt so drained I could hardly stay on my feet. I wonder if the magical girls and transforming heroes from all those shows the set forces me to watch with her also get this tired after they transform. Do they get a craving for an ice cold beer too? I heave a sigh and sit on my bed. The set crawls over to my feet and stares starts rubbing her head into my lap. Before she can get any more friendly, though, how she comes out of the bathroom, our gaze is meet. <laughs> she stops for a moment at the door, though, turning around to face us for a second. Feral child, you taint. With that remark, she leaves the room. I know. For all her complaints, how she respects her relationship, and she does her best to be considerate of us. But she can be so clever it's scary. I realize I might have come across a callous for thinking that way, but she scares me. I wrap my arms tightly around Lisette's head. It's fine, she doesn't understand. For the next operation, the Special Warfare Trooper Unit will deploy for the very beginning. It's clear that they're treating us differently now. For the last mission, we were stationed on Base 32, a small base moving along the Earth's orbit. But now that they've lost so many ships and personnel, we've been assigned to the far larger Atlantic base, which is now vacant of its usual garrison. This military base is located between Earth and the Moon. Its facilities are much better equipped, so life here is far more comfortable. Of course, our personal quarters and the base's commander, command center are built from the same modular design. So those spaces are pretty much the same as on base 32. Exactly. There's no point trying to conceal the casualties from the previous operation. After all, they were so competent they'd win that they'd had media ships right at the scene of the battle. Multiple media outlets have covered our hero, heroics. In fact, at this point, your actions are the only thing the reporters are talking about. <laughs> The survivors on the fleet are being recognized into reorganized into the first task force together with you three. Whatever no but I got a Kogatano Sport Tiger Niva Taiko de Kimasu. This is a good on no many Taiko de Kirito or Moemasen. Based on your achievements during the last operation, the top brass thinks you can. They think we're capable of destroying that thing? No matter how you look at it, we're going to lose big time. I'll explain the operation's outlines then. The reorganized UEF military will be defending New Beijing and New Washington with everything they have. I can feel the presence of the CC swarm quickly approaching us. The swarm shines brightly against the black backdrop of space, reminding me of a large school of migrating fish. The ship that dropped us off has already retreated. At this point, it's only us versus them in the space sector. The 
The moon's surface is far below us. The two stains splashed across it are New Beijing and New Washington. The visible parts that are on the surface are just heat exchangers and various communication arrays. The majority of the cities themselves are underground. S the citizens have already finished evacuating. The only people left down there are a ground unit waiting to play their role in the attack to come. Cruising between us and the moon's surface is the UEF's first task force. そしてそして裏ではステージの秘密戦隊僕がいつもゴロゴロダラダラしてるけどこれという時にはバチッと決めるキャプテンでシルケがおっぱい大きくて真面目な秘書さんキャプテンは仕事中にも秘書さんといつ
first, she roughly estimates the enemy's position and fires a spray of low-powered lasers. These can't penetrate the enemy, the alien's barriers, but she can figure out which ones were hit by searching for the resulting infrared rays. Based on which lasers hit from the previous volley, she narrows the spread while increasing each shot's power. Eventually, she pierces the enemy's barrages barriers entirely, shooting the aliens down. The CC formation begins to turn our way. Maybe the aliens have some kind of preference for the number five, because they always come in groups of that size. The enemies drawing closer makes Kanchu's lasers that much more accurate. The CC are already taking considerable losses from weathering the one-sided barrage. Five groups of five managed to survive Kanchu's persistent fire. They close in on us at rapid speed. She shoots down 11 of them, but 14 still remain before they're upon us. Lissette springs forward and I follow suit. Lissette's body shines with a blinding white light as the aura around her morphs into the shape of the sword. She dives into the enemy ranks. I manifest my long lance into my hands, thrusting it forward as well. <laughs> She spins the white blade like a whirlwind, mowing down, slashing through, and tearing apart the enemy. She amazes me every time I look at her. Whichever ones attempt to avoid her attacks meet their end at the tip of my spear. Those that get past me are perfectly shot down by Kanchu's lasers. It doesn't take long for us to wipe the enemy out. We follow Kanchu's gates. The rest of the enemy group that had ignored us up until now is spreading out as they approach us. Kanchu's shots become stronger and more accurate the closer the enemy comes. She shoots the enemies down on one another in large numbers. Wherever I look, all I see are more CC. Space billows around us. I can feel it shaking across my skin. Lisette swings herself around like the very sword she wields, spinning like a tornado as she charges straight toward the incoming enemy. She certainly doesn't look like she's planning to retreat. Kanji doesn't look concerned at all. But that's because she doesn't know Lisette as well as I do. I have to keep my wits about her. About me. <laughs> if Lisette's going wild, I'm the only one who can really pull her back. That is my responsibility here. Slowly but steadily, the battleground shifts closer to the moon. Lissette thrusts deep into the enemy force. I cut down enemies she overlooks, and Kanchu shoots down any that can pass me. Kanchu's attack range is extremely wide, allowing her to cover us from the rear as we continue to assault the enemy head on. But there's too many of them. Inevitably, some of them, though not many, slip past us three. Each time they do, Lissette simply goes. She turns abruptly and takes off after the fleeing aliens, cutting them down while shouting all the while. She's entirely keen on not letting a single one escape her. Watching her chase after the enemy yet again, I mutter to myself. I don't know why it keeps freezing. It turns out that I don't actually have to stop her. I 
understand what Kanchu means by that. The burden is us. We're supposed to be protecting the rear, but despite our efforts, some of the aliens are slipping past us. Someone has to pursue them and finish them off. Between the two of us, Kanju has more kills by far. I'm nothing but a burden for the set. I just try to break out. Kanju looks over my shoulder. That is the UEF's first task force. The earlier battle proved that they were powerless against the CC, given that Lissette insists on being a hero who protects the weak. They are no different from civilians. She's responsible for watching over. あれはリゼットの行動を制約するためだったのですわね。面相立ててやるふりをして、あそこへ配置させるように仕向けたんですわ。まず、うちの司令官閣下は食えないお人。Major Kenison. If it wasn't for him, we'd only be seen as women who had something strange implanted into their bodies by the aliens. We'd have been quarantined, or worse, experimented on like guinea pigs. The only reason we're not being put under the knife and instead being allowed to fight is thanks to him. I'm extremely grateful for everything he's done, but he may be a scarier man than I realize. It doesn't feel like the enemy's attacks are dying down, but... That thing must be coming. The Seth flies back to us. We can all sense it. This, that gigantic enemy, the Dawn's Eye, the enemy that attacked us and gave us this power, its trajectory turns toward us. But that is exactly as our operation plan predicted. Several hours ago, during our briefing, I'll explain the operation's outline then. The reorganized UBF military will be defending New Beijing and New Washington with everything they have. Lissette's Ian Kanshi's expressions filled with disappointment. I could understand their disappointment. This isn't a defensive plan. It's an offensive plan, meant to make effective use of our reactor warheads, despite their slow speed and self small effective radius. At Mars, the enemy destroyed all of the facilities orbiting the planet before descending to the planet's surface. There, they ransacked all the bases, slaughtering and abducting all the personnel. They will likely attempt to do the same with the moon. However, if we can put enough resistance, the enemy flyers will be incapable of completing those objectives. In that situation, the most powerful unit they have, Redan's Eye, will be forced to personally arrive in order to deal with you. Lissette's eyes practically lit up. <laughs> no, as powerful as you are, we're not expecting that much out of you. <laughs> Indeed, I didn't think our power would be effective against something that massive. Still, I couldn't help but think that we'd somehow figure out some way to deal with all it all the same. If the war is going to be done, the war will be the two of the two. The war will be the two of the two. The war will be the two of the two. Exactly. Once all of the citizens have been evacuated, we'll bring large numbers of reactor warheads into the cities. You three just need to keep the fight going. Right until the very last moment, then make your retreat. Once you do, the enemy will go for the cities. That exactly. If we fire the reactor warheads from close range, it shouldn't be able to avoid them. They are propelled by rockets, albeit very simple ones. From the previous battles, we know that the blasts of reactor warheads are able to damage the alien flyers. The world governments are gathering up all the reactor warheads they have hoarded and are sending them all to the moon right now. Footage of a constant stream of ships arriving at and departing from the moon's Armstrong spaceport in Central Harbor plays on the holographic display. 
They are bringing nuclear warheads on their trip to the moon and evacuating refugees on their way back. Still, I'm assuming they're preparing for what comes after this war, because what they're delivering is much less than what we know they have. At any rate, this is by far the biggest stockpile of firepower in one place ever since the dawn of human history. A small number of inspection personnel will remain there until the last minute. It's a do or die mission, but we've had many volunteers. Morale is on the rise. That last battle was effective in getting everyone's spirits up. If nothing else, it proved the enemy can be destroyed. <laughs> The media has been having a field day with your heroics. Your identities are still confidential, though. Earth knows about you, but the rest is still secret. She's a little fool. Yes, yeah, she is. Personally, I think that optimism, optimism the lets her see the best in any situation, was one of her best qualities. Madan's eye approaches men naively, menacingly. Why well, I don't know why I can't read. If, as if blooming over the two cities, the enemy hovers some 18 miles above the moon's surface. We've been performing a fighting retreat over the course of four whole hours, luring the enemy to this specific spot. The blue light spilling from its eye light hair, tear, <laughs> shines down on New Beijing and New Washington. Standing our ground in this slither of space between the enemy and the cities, we continue fighting the CC flyers. We've kept the CC from reaching the cities preventing them from discovering that they were abandoned save for the volunteer units. <laughs> the sun flits freely through the air, much like her gigantic sword that cuts down the enemies one by one. <laughs> Any flyers that get past the set are either shot down by Kanshu and her six teddy bear lasers, or slashed apart by my spear. The UEF unit consisting of the few ships that were able to cobble together has already retreated. At this point, it's just us and the personnel hiding in the nearby cities. <laughs> Whenever did she descend down to the surface of Rian's eye and come back? The transmission rings in my ears. The launch units down in the cities are finally ready to fire the reactor warheads. This means we have to start falling back. Britain's eye is too large to get away quickly. At this range, it won't have the time to retreat. We begin to withdraw from the battlefield. Redan's eye has so much mass that it's influencing gravity around the moon. Some of the designated escape routes along the moon's surface must have collapsed. We hurry over to our allies' position. As we fly above the moon's surface, we can see that some of the two tunnels connecting the city to the spaceport have been destroyed. Several people in spacesuits are crawling out of the crashed vehicle. The moment they spot us, they wave and raise their hands and cheer. Yes, 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 yes,
そういうのは終わってからですわそれに秘密戦隊が最後ってどうするんですの<笑>秘密戦隊はつらいね We touched down and ushered them back into their vehicle. Once they're all secured inside, the three of us deploy our force fields. A force field, that's the colloquial term for the field that surrounds us when we transform. It includes our magical girl outfits, our weapons, and the barriers we produce. It's a little hard to explain, but we expand our force field so they envelop the vehicle. Once we lift the vehicle up into the air, we begin carrying it with us to the spaceport. An overbearing, coercive pressure washes over me, making me look up. Redon's eye glowers down at us, seeming so close that it seems like all it would take to touch it is to extend my hand. Blue light spills from its gaping eye like tear, casting a pale azure. Low over us all. I realize now that the blue surface looks as though it's dripping, almost like the eye is weeping, but the、uh, undulating substance is in tears, its tentacles. Gigantic, pale blue tentacles reach down toward us. Yeah, but, 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 The swarm of tentacles grows even larger. It rapidly fills the skies as the tips come even ever closer. We slowly lower our altitude in an attempt to escape the tentacles. It seems that our presence has been noticed at this point. It looks as though a bluish whirlwind is raging all around us. It finally comes to a realization. The three of us, I'm contributing the least toward towing the vehicle. If Lisette or Kanshu were to leave, the vehicle would plummet to the ground. But it wouldn't if I did. I'm accomplishing the least here. It'd be better for me to make use of myself in a different way. I've released the grip of my force field. When I pull away, the vehicle lurches once as Kanshu and Lisette adjust their grip. A moment later, they recover and resume flying. Away. I made it best. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> I manifest my weapon back into existence and launch an attack on one of the massive tentacles pursuing the vehicle. The moment my weapon hits home, there's a powerful shockwave that sends me flying back. Blue liquid gushes from the tentacle where I struck it. At the very least, I can damage it. That small discovery gives me courage. I slash three more times at the tentacle, closing in on the vehicle. It's too thick for me to cut through it, but I am clearly hurting it. The blue, bluish blood pouring from its wound freezes in the blink of an eye. Forming an absurd blizzard that covers the moon's surface. Some part of me can't help but think that the sight is beautiful. Maybe that errant thought is what doomed me, or maybe I'm simply too weak. By the time I notice a second presence nearing me, the other massive tentacle has already swooped in on me from my flank. There's no time to dodge it. It slams into me, sending me flying through the air. My thoughts fade to black. I'm fading into nothing. I'm falling into a cold darkness where I can't feel anything. No. No, I don't want this. Not this. I don't want this. But I have no way of resisting. I'm fading away. Fading away. Fading away. My arms, my legs, my stomach, my head, all of them fading away. Ugh, it's all over. Something thrusts into my head. A cold hand, bent on wiping me out of existence. Chill flows into every root and fold of my brain. I'm fading away. Listen. She appears within the light. A person enveloped in sacred white light. A light shaped like a sword. That's right, it's Lisette, the person I hold dearer than anyone, the one I never want to be torn away from. 
I am, that's right, I'm Circe. My name flares up within my withered existence like a flame rushing through my body. <laughs> the tubes attacking my body are severed at the roots. My limbs feel light all of a sudden. I feel something leave my body. Although I feel light, I can't muster enough strength to move. Immediately after, something tightly embraces me. Instead, <laughs> flies off with me in her arms. A large mass of tentacles pursues us from all directions, trying to spot us back down to the surface. Yet somehow, was set when I slip through a narrow, twisting path within the tumbles of tentacles. It's as if time and space themselves differ, defer to the set's feet. We escape the flurry of whip-like tentacles crawling in our wake. But just then, a thick trunk of tentacles thrust towards us from Lisette's blind spot. We can't get away. And on top of that, red lasers are closing in on us from ahead. Yet, Lisette doesn't even try to avoid them. She continues flying straight ahead without a moment's hesitation. The laser hits the thick tentacles just as its tip winds back to strike at us. Splashes of blue bodily fluids billow from its flesh as its swing misses us by a hair oh, no, yes, Who is she? Why is she so friendly with the set? I don't like it. The set's mine. Can't this woman just die? Oh, That's the sort of person we are without memories? Okay. Huh? It sounds like she knows me too. Missy, I remember Lissa calling someone that. Yes, I remember. This is Ganshu. Her, no, our friend. Regret runs through me. I can't believe I harbor such dark feelings about Ganshu. I even wished for her death. With me still in her arms, Lisette blitzes past Hanshu and flies off. Looking behind her, I see Hanshu firing more red lasers to fend off the pursuing tentacles while she falls back with us. That's when it happens. A massive boulder hurtles past us, launched from the moon's surface. Something else impacts Raiden's eye directly from behind her. Mass drivers catapults are used to propel resources from the moon into Earth's orbit. The titanium, aluminum, and iron collected from the moon's automated mines is loaded into unmanned pallets, which are then launched from each mine via railgun. Accelerated by a force in excess of 10 Gs, the cargo breaks free of the moon's gravity and flies through space at 1.24 miles per second until it is caught by a net in Earth's orbit. Each of the 15 mines dotting the moon's surface delivers hundreds of tons of resources to the orbital bases and factories around the Earth. These resources are crucial for development within space. By changing their firing angles ever so slightly, they can instead fire payloads into Radon's eye. These cruel but massive projectiles are causing more damage than any laser or, or ordinance can. <laughs> Redon's eye stops pursuing us, instead turning its blue gaze towards the moon's surface. Just as the enemy looks down, red flashes and smoke begin to rise up from the two cities, which are crumbling under the gravitational pull of the gigantic enemy's mass. The reactor warheads, gathered by mankind's powers, are launched from close range directly into the enemy's eye. At this distance, there's no way it can possibly avoid them. Sound doesn't travel through vacuum, but I'm sure that the blast would otherwise be deafening. Flashing specks of the reaction warheads explodes, sprout from the surface of the downturned eye. Redon's eyes 
massive form shakes ever so slightly and crashes into the moon's surface, sinking into the lunar yes, soil. The operation was a complete success. Mankind has won. I think so, anyway. For some reason, I can't feel any excitement. Correct, the operation was successful, but Radon's eye is still active. The monitor is filled with camera feeds of the enemy's gigantic form. At first, it looks like it's completely still, but then... Yes, it's hardly visible from this distance, but it seems to be trying to push itself away from the moon. A magnified feel, view of the enemy makes the situation clearer. With the two cities crushed beneath its weight, Redon, uh, Redon's eye is now attempting to lift itself out of the massive crater its fall created. It certainly hasn't escaped unscathed. We've temporarily forced it into an inert state, but the fact it can still move after all that means it might as well be invincible. The UEF has no more cards to play. If Redon's eye were to descend from the Earth, it would be a catastrophe. It would bring about a massacre, death dwarfing what it did to Mars and the Moon. But oddly enough, that realization doesn't stir any emotion in me. To me, that knowledge simply seems like a cold hard fact. Yes, it would be a terrible thing for the species of mankind to suffer, but my mind remains indifferent, as if asking, so what? Some part of my part of me is terrified of that indifference. Right now, Raiden's eye floats completely above the moon's surface, begins moving once more. What's the enemy's course? To answer Commander Kinnison's question, a projection of Raiden's eye predicted course is brought up in the center of the ship. eye is moving toward one of the mines.